to what I'd like to talk about tonight is I'd like to talk about our responsibility to our pastor. And I'd like to, you to turn with me, and I'm actually going to turn this week. I'd like you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. And we're going to begin to read at verse 17. And the verse that we're going to focus on is verse 17, but we're going to read some of the other chapter, some of the other chapter, some of the other verses for context here. So Hebrews chapter 13, starting at verse 17, and reading down to verse 22. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all, and I urge you all the more to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good things, thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, Amen. Okay. So, Guy is our pastor. <laughs> now, we have three elders in the church, but Guy is in a special position, as you are well aware, that he is the one who has his life set aside. Dad and I both work, right? And neither Dad nor I have had formal training. Uh, we have not done formal studies. And Guy has both formal training and studies, and he is given the freedom to act on your behalf and to work for you throughout the week. That he has that time to set aside, to devote to studying the Word of God and prayer. And so, I wanted us to explore how exactly we should relate. And verse 17 lays it out pretty clearly. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Now, to begin with, I just want you to understand the magnitude of the responsibility that Guy Myers has. Because it is an awesome responsibility. Now, you're all familiar with the passage in James, I'm sure, in James chapter 3, verse 1, that says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, that extra judgment is of weighty concern. But the verse that I want to give you, or the verses that I want to give you, that really, to me, punch the pastor in the gut, so to speak, are from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And they say, I'm going to go fast, so you can try and keep up, but I have them out here. Okay, I charge you, and this is Paul writing to Timothy, the elder at Ephesus, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Think about that passage and what that is, because that is to the elders, right? That is to Guy Myers. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Now think about that. Being in the presence of Almighty God in His throne room. Surrounded 
by a huge cloud of witnesses of saints that have gone before, surrounded by the angels, right, all witnessing this kind of act, this solemn charge, right? This is not some light recommendation or some light counsel. This is a solemn charge to do the job of pastoring. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing, so remember, He's coming back, and His kingdom. Remember, He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He will set up, and your rewards are directly related to how you perform here, and you will be judged, and you will be judged more strictly. And so I am charging you, Timothy, in God's presence, to be the pastor that you need to be. That's pretty weighty. That's pretty awesome responsibility. That's pretty scary. Because you think about it, that He is guard over your soul. He is watching over your soul, right, as one who has to give an account. That is scary. <laughs> He's not responsible to an earthly boss. He's not responsible to some employer. He's responsible to God Almighty who watches him 24-7, 365 and keeps him accountable. That's scary. Back in Ezekiel, and you don't have to turn here either, I just want to reference it because in Ezekiel, God charges the shepherds of the sheep in Ezekiel with not caring for the sheep. And says, I am against you. I am against you. Because you don't feed the sheep. You don't protect the sheep. You don't heal the sheep. You're fat in yourselves. And I wanted to impress this upon you tonight because we live in an age where the pastor is just a buddy where the pastor has been lowered down, where he's just another part of the congregation, and so he is not given due honor. Now, I don't want us to go back to a Roman Catholic type of form where a guy has to put a hat, right? And we have to kiss his hand. The Pope's got a pointy hat here. <laughs> okay, but I don't want... That. The reverence that the Bible wants us to give, that's not the honor that the Bible wants us to give for our pastor. But he is due honor because he has a great responsibility. He is accountable for your soul. He is under the great shepherd and responsible. And so I want you to think about that. His life is dedicated to you. And he is not served by the sheep. He is the sheep's slave. I own animals. They need to be fed. They need to be protected. They need to be led here and there. You are sheep. I am sheep. <laughs> right? And we need fed and protected and led. And the one who does that and I know that in my household, we are tied to the animals. They have to be cared for, whether you bloody well feel like it or not. If you're tired and want to go to bed, Chris, you've got to go out and close up the animals. They need protection. Right? If you're late for work, somebody has to go out and feed the animals and water the animals. They have to be tended. And the shepherd has to tend the animals. It's his job. And the shepherd is not the hireling. The hireling doesn't care about the sheep. But the shepherd does. And so, you hear in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 28 and 30, and apart from other things, and he's just finished listing off all his trials, shipwrecks, beatings, all that stuff, and apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. 
That is the heart of the shepherd. The heart of the shepherd is for the well-being of the sheep. Okay. Now, if we consider that the under-shepherd is not acting on his own, but he acts in accordance with the will of the one who has sent him. <coughs> right? He does the feeding of the sheep in accordance with how his father wants him to feed the sheep. He protects the sheep on the basis of this is how his father wants him to protect the sheep. He leads the sheep on the basis of this is how my father wants me to lead the sheep. He does not act on his own, but he acts on the behalf of the one who sent him. Okay. So in that, we should take two points. One is that obedience to the under-shepherd is obedience to the great shepherd. And secondly, love for the great shepherd means that we will work with and not against the under shepherd. Not rocket science, is it? It's pretty basic, pretty simple stuff. You've probably heard it a million times. Okay, but what does it mean for you? Now, I'm looking out over you tonight, and you look like sheep. No offense. <laughs> but you look like sheep. And yeah. I have animals. Yeah, bad, bad. I have animals, and when you look out in a pen of goats, you will see some that are drowsy, and you will see some that are hyperactive, right? You'll see some that seem to be attentive to you, and you'll see some that are just sort of daydreaming and off in la-la land. Right? You'll see little ones, big ones, short ones. You know, you get the picture. Anyways, so you look like sheep, and when I'm sitting where you are, I look like sheep, and because I am sheep. But do we look like sheep without a pastor? Without a shepherd, I meant. Do we look like sheep without a shepherd in our daily lives? Now, how does how do sheep without a shepherd look? Well, sheep without a shepherd tend to be less healthy, right? They tend to be less healthy. Sheep without a shepherd tend to be jumpy. And if you've ever seen animals, they, you know, there's a bang and they're, they see a shadow. I was watching Jenny ride her horse and like there was this car seat on the side of the road. And the car seat never moved. But that horse suddenly noticed the car seat and almost threw Jenny for a loop. And it's like, ah, it's a car seat! Right? And sheep tend to be, that have a shepherd tend to be organized. And sheep that don't have a shepherd don't tend to be organized. And so, how is it in your life as sheep? Are you sheep with a pastor? How is your spiritual life? Right? Are you healthy in your spiritual life? Or are you sickly? Are you doing your devotions? Are you doing your prayers? Right? How is your spiritual health? How is your jumpiness? Right? Does every little thing that happens to you in life knock you off your rocker? Right? Are you unsettled by everything? Right? That happens. Oh, no, that's it. I'm not going to church anymore. I can't take it. Right? Oh, that's too much to deal with. I can't deal with that. I can't take it. Right? Are you a jumpy sheep? Are you jumpy sheep? Does everything set you into a tizzy? Are you independent sheep? Unorganized. Each for his own. Going your own way. Doing your own thing. When you want to do it and how you want to do it. Are you not part of the collective flock? But you are your own sheep. And easily... Pray for the wolves. Are we sheep with a shepherd? Do we follow our shepherd? Now, as a shepherd, if you could communicate with your sheep, what would you tell them so that your job would be a joy and so that you wouldn't groan? 
Because I know, having animals, you're trying to get animals to do what you want them to do, and they don't want to do it. And so you're, you think you got them cornered, and you think they can't go anywhere, and you go to grab them, and boom, they're gone. And it's a dirty, exhausting, sometimes thankless, and sometimes dangerous job trying to get sheep or any other animal to do what they don't want to, to do. And so if you could communicate to them what it is that would make your job as a shepherd easier and more of a joy and less of a chore, what would you communicate to them? I think you'd communicate two things. Trust and obedience. Right? That's what you communicate to them. Trust and obedience. That's what I'd want for my animals. And my kids. <laughs> Trust and obedience. Let's put them in different. How about support and cooperation? When you have a pastor who is a shepherd, do you support him and do you cooperate with him? By support, I mean not only financial support because we pay guys salary. That's true. But there is so much more to support. How does support relate to trust? Support relates to trust in that you trust that he is a gift from God to you. And you trust that he is doing his job. And so because you trust that he is doing his job, you support him. That means that you don't badmouth him. That means that you don't allow other people to badmouth him. That means that you give him encouragement. That means that you pray for him. That means that you are there for him when he needs you. That is support. That is what makes a pastor's job a joy. What about cooperation? Well, certainly... Cooperation comes into play because in order for him to do his job and lead you, you have to cooperate with him. In order for the flock to go in the proper direction under the leadership of the shepherd, they have to cooperate with him. And when they don't cooperate, it is such a chore to use the rod and the staff. The rod to move them back into the flock. The staff to move them back into the flock. The rod to smuck them. Oh, no, no, we don't do that. That's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> right? Rebuke and correct. It says for him to do it. That's his job. Sometimes he has to use the rod with gentleness as much as possible, but he still has to use the rod. He still has to tell you, no, that's not right, you can't do that, that's not right. Right? And that hurts our pride, but it's necessary. Okay. Practical. How are you doing in this? Let me ask you a question. I think I've asked this before. How many sermons have you heard in your lifetime now? Just a, you know, just a quick, you know, estimate, you know, five. Eight hundred, I'd say. <laughs> eight hundred. I bet you it's more. <laughs> I bet you it's more than eight hundred sermons. Okay, how are you doing at doing what was laid out in the sermons? Oh, you who are going in your seat and going, you know, this isn't so bad. It's not so hard. How many times has God spoke from the pulpit and give the instructions from the Word of God and you've listened, gone home, and no change. None. Zero. None. Now, if you're the shepherd, and you want to lead the sheep in a particular direction, and you go, we're going in this direction, and the sheep go in that direction, or they keep going straight, do you think that makes his job a joy or a chore? Obviously, it's going to be a growing episode to try and get that whole flock to go over here, out of danger, out of harm's way, to keep saying, we're going over here, we're going over here, 
We're going over here. We're going over here. We're going over here. No reaction. Hello? Right? But you guys admit that you listen to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon with no effect. There was a, Mark Keeler actually did a sermon on how to listen to sermons. And one of the things that he mentioned in the sermon on how to listen to sermons was is that you come prepared to take in the sermon and implement it in your life. That it just doesn't come in your ears, bounce around, and get lost and fade off. That it actually comes into your heart and into your mind, and you actually digest it. And then you go out from the church, and Monday morning you put it in implementation. Right? Now I know, because that's not where you are, I am sheep. <laughs> right? And I have listened to sermon after sermon after sermon. I have even gone, man, that was a great sermon. Next day, what was that sermon about anyway? Right? Gone. Poof. But we make the pastor's job a joy when, when he actually sees a fact. He's excited. It's a thrill for him to see. He's here. Shh. <laughs> it's a thrill for him to actually experience that you come up to him the next day and say, Listen, guy, I did that. That was fabulous. Or, man, I said that and that guy punched me right in the mouth. <laughs> right? Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That was good. Right? Persecution is good for church. Right? Okay. So, doing it. Being not cult-like followers. That's not what I'm saying. Guy preaches, we do. Right? That's not what I'm saying. Be the Berean. Be the Berean. Search the Scripture. That makes his job a joy. When he knows that you're pouring over the Scripture and you come back with questions about the sermon that he preached, he knows that it didn't just die on the pew. He knows that you're meditating, digesting, pouring over, and then you speak to him about the sermon that he preached, and he's excited. He's thrilled. You know, it happens once in a while, so I know. <laughs> okay. The next question. What advantage is there? This is the last point, right? Because it went as follows. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be no advantage to you. What advantage do you reap from submitting to the leadership, to the pastor? I like Psalm 14 or 141:5. Let a righteous man strike me; it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me; it is oil for my head. And let my head not refuse it. It's good for you, right? Think about this. There, the hypothetical situation. There's a girl getting ready for a for a wedding, right? Just you know, pull that one out of nowhere. There's a girl getting ready for a wedding. Now, usually girls don't get ready for a wedding by themselves. They have attendants, right? And the attendants' job is to help the bride look beautiful. That's their job. That's what they do. So she goes and she does her hair and they help her with her hair and they straighten her, whatever those girls do in those rooms, right? And, right, and they tell her if there's something hanging out of her nose, right, because that's important, right? If she fights against her, her attendants, if she kicks against the goad, then when she goes down the aisle, She's not going to look as good as she should. She's not going to be without spot or blemish. Right? She's not going to cover up the zit with some makeup. She's going to leave it. It's going to look bad. Right? But if she works with her attendants, if you work with the shepherd, then he can present you to Christ as beautiful. Because that's his job. He wants you to look gorgeous for Jesus Christ because you are the bride of Christ. And he's excited to be part of the wedding. 
He's excited to make you look beautiful. Work with Him. Work with Him so that He can say with the Apostle John, and I love this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's a pastor's heart. And that's what breaks his heart when you're not. And that's what gives him joy when you are. Because as the pastor, he loves you. And he wants to see you built up and made beautiful. Dallas, would you close with prayer? Heavenly Father, we uh, all sat in your presence and heard your word to our ears, and I pray, God, that you would burn it into our hearts, and it would cause change. I pray this to your glory, to your honor, that much praise and glory would come off our lips, Lord, that we would be an encouragement and not a hindrance to our pastor. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.